Out of all the female artists who blew up in the 2000s and just disappeared, Nelly Furtado fascinates me the most. She had the look, the talent, you know, she had a bunch of hits, was associated with Timbaland, and it's odd to me that she just disappeared like that. Maybe she did on her own terms. Furtado was born in Victoria, British Columbia on December 2nd, 1978. Her parents were Portuguese immigrants coming into Canada, and at a young age, Furtado began singing and playing musical instruments. She soon realized music was her passion, and Furtado began hanging around musicians at parks and malls. She ended up forming a group at age 17 called Nell Star in 1996. The group itself did gain some kind of notoriety in Canada but she didn't really feel the group saying it was too segregated and that I don't know if it represented my personality enough and vocally it wasn't showcasing what I could do with my voice after this she performed at the Honey Jam talent show in 1997 Honey Jam is a yearly concert held in Canada that intends to showcase the country's female artists Ebony Rowe played a strong part in creating Honey Jam feeling there was a lack of true opportunities for women and as an answer to hip hop's often misogynistic lyrics towards women Nelly Furtado featured on the 1997 edition of Honey Jam and she managed to get herself an audition and despite her hopes the result was nowhere near what she ever imagined. We always hear about those big breaks that happen at a moment's notice and for the Portuguese Canadian singer what's happened to many in the past was about to come to fruition for her. Furtado didn't expect much that day but do what she usually did, perform. She had hopes but it didn't go beyond anything huge. Suddenly her performance caught the eye of Philosopher King's lead singer Gerald Eaton now known as Jarvis Church and his manager Chris Smith. Furtado was noted as having a sincerity to her voice that grabbed me, according to Church. Ebony Rose said, At that time, Honey Jam was really an all-urban show. That's how we started, just very focused on hip-hop and everyone was black. So Nelly really stood out because she was for one not black, but she was also very tiny and her style of music was more electric. It wasn't hip-hop, it wasn't R&B, it was this interesting fusion. This would become a common theme in Furtado's music throughout her early career. At the beginning of her performance, everyone was talking, but then once they heard her voice, you could hear a pin drop. She had everyone's attention. Furtado at the time, a part of the band, Nell Star performed a song called Like... My future manager Chris Smith was so smart because he had Gerald Jarvis Church with him because I didn't know Chris's face but I knew Gerald so he said wow that was really good and I just want you to meet my manager Chris. We exchanged phone numbers and I got to jam with Gerald a few weeks later. Funny story because Chris Smith was annoyed with not having free tickets for himself and his friends but that ticket contributed to some of his biggest success in the music industry. Rose and internet BMG at the time said hey there's a girl called Nell Star. Rose was persistent about Nelly and her persistence finally paid off. She said she was going to perform at the Honey Jam and as I was going to see Nelly I invited Jarvis along to check out some new talent. Even though Furtado was meeting with these music artists and personalities she intended to go to college back home majoring as a creative writer. She took a break following this focusing on traveling and creative writing. Her vibe and decision making was very slow and she was almost unaware of what kind of opportunity she had. And Gerald Ian reminded her. Even though they recorded something at Sony Music Canada, Furtado was still studying at school for creative writing and preparing to travel in Europe. She maintained a close relationship with Brian West who was Ian's bandmate. Gerald Ian himself and of course her future agent Chris Smith. From the moment the three of us stepped into a studio and did my demo tape, I knew we we could make something phenomenal together. There came a point where after multiple visits from Ian and West that they asked her to fly out to Toronto. The chemistry was felt immediately with Furtado writing her first song, My Love Grows Deeper Part 1. Recording a demo was mostly easy for Nelly Furtado and most of the songs on Woe Nelly were actually recorded during this time. It was around 1998 or the end of the year. Future Grammy Award winner Chris Taylor represented Furtado as her attorney at the time and was looking for potential suitors to sign the singer. The demo tape contained most of the songs on Woe Nelly with her final addition to the tape last minute being ironically her biggest hit at the time, I'm Like a Bird. The night before we'd arrive in LA and Gerald and Brian heard some of my new stuff and said hey tonight when you get home why don't you write some more songs give it a last go. I always did do my homework at the last minute so I just kind of scrapped together something real quick. The night before we'd arrive in LA and Gerald and Brian heard some of my new stuff and said hey tonight when you get home why don't you write some more songs give it a last go. I always did do my homework at the last minute so I just kind of scrapped together something real quick. Luckily that morning I came up with three songs the third was Bird and when I got to the studio I said check this out. Initially they were scared of it because it was so huge. We got a demo and an engineer in the studio kept saying that demo that's a his song you've got to record that song this is a common trait in the music industry you hear often how a song might be too big for somebody that's something that happens every often dreamworks managed to come into contact with Furtado around this time and were amazed by her talent her music was still considered different because she mixed a couple of genres including hip-hop and many other ethnic sub-genres this helped her stand out but also caused her concern because of the possibility of being pigeonholed to a certain genre one of the things Nelly Furtado prided herself on was being the classic artist 
first. Pop stars at that time performed songs but didn't compose them or at least play a deep role in making a song. They just performed it. And for the record labels, it was quantity over quality because their music never needed to be just that. It sold anyways. Nelly Furtado was signed to DreamWorks Records of Universal Music Group around 1999 and her signing was so hyped within the label that she had a meeting with the head of the record label, David Geffen. DreamWorks seemed to understand and see how talented Furtado was and she had international appeal and a very relatable story. Even then, the real work had yet to begin. Furtado, along with her attorney and a representative from DreamWorks, went around the country to radio stations in order to convince them to play her music. Her talent shined bright though and more often than not, it worked out even though there was plenty of competition for airtime. Her decision to sign with DreamWorks wasn't that hard, they gave her the freedom to work with her guys Ian and West. Jive, Electra, and Interscope were seeking her signature, but that convinced her to go with DreamWorks Records. The meeting came after the artist executive Beth Halper listened to a 20-second tape of Furtado and conceded that she was a special talent with the ability to pierce the soul. Her meeting with Furtado came on February 17, 1999, and shortly afterward, a month later in March of 1999, Nelly Furtado was an official member of DreamWorks Records. She declined a $3 million offer from another record label, and it didn't take long for DreamWorks to bring her in and produce music. Her song Party was featured on the Broke Down Palace soundtrack later that year, and work was being done for Nelly's first studio album entitled Whoa Nelly. The genre of the music was labeled pop, but it went beyond that. It was a fusion of hip hop and other subgenres, including Brazilian music, Portuguese music, Indian music, and Billboard themselves properly described it as trip pop. It's a pop record, but the, it has roots to it. Furtado called her album a snapshot of the transition from being a teenager to adulthood. It captures a lot of confusion you experienced during that time. Furtado was influenced by a bunch of musicians TLC, Lionel Richie, Mariah Carey, Paula Abdul, Beck, and that influence can be shown. It was a matter of her refusing to pigeonhole herself. Why would she remain with one single genre when she has a versatile skill set? I don't look at it that way. I see it more like I have ammunition. It's a pop record, but the, it has roots to it. It's the sound of the product of 90s influences, which we haven't seen yet. But even though Furtado was doing things her way, and this is something I heard her say constantly in her interviews, it didn't stop detractors from feeling that she sold out, which is ironic considering this sentiment would be shared by many more in 2006. Well, Nelly was promoted like crazy at the time. DreamWorks felt that they secured a smash hit, and Nelly Furtado to them was undeniable, and it was only a matter of time before the world was introduced to her. The album was very good, especially for a debut star. Hey Man, On The Radio, I'm Like A Bird, and Turn Off The Light were notable singles, with my personal favorite being On The Radio, Remember The Days. And to diss towards those that thought she was selling out, and Furtado made no problem letting them know that she's doing things her way. I wrote something like on the radio because I was mad at all those fake friends who said to me make sure you don't sell out now that you signed a record deal. I'm like a bird felt like an optimistic morning song turn off the light was a song that brought a lot of future success for Furtado. It was her deep struggle in the dark. She's said to be a girl that acts tough but it's a different story when you turn off the light. Sounds corny when I say it but when she says it, it's a much different thing. It was released on October 24, 2000 to critical praise and a bunch took a liking to Furtado's voice and the optimistic music that she was making. It felt like in a time of pop projects in general and of course new metal bands, Furtado was looking to carve her own path but also finding it necessary to appeal to the general public. In turn, this fusion brought forward Whoa Nelly. While the album was praised, the album wasn't a success initially. The record label had doubts over sales, not Furtado's talent. There was many times where the radio stations were about to drop Furtado's music because of how disappointing sales were, as she sold 4,000 copies her first week. But there was always something to save her. People were interested in hearing more of Furtado's music. Suddenly, sales were coming in, it was 12,000 copies, then it was more momentum, interviews with MTV, Rolling Stone, and from out of nowhere, Nelly Furtado had her first hit album. She started selling 55,000 albums a week and was considered one of the breakthrough artists of 2001. She went from worrying over her performances to opening up for U2 and doing a duet with Elton John. Wonderful times for Furtado. She even featured on a remix to Missy Elliott's Get Your Freak On later that year for the Tomb Raider soundtrack, a song composed by Timbaland. This would be the first collaboration collaboration between both sides in the start of a very successful partnership. Timbaland also produced a remix to turn off the light featuring Miss Jade, and Miss Jade also included Furtado in the song Ching Ching, which once again was produced by Timbaland. Their relationship would blossom over the next few years, but in 2001, Nelly Furtado was enjoying being the new breakout artist. Turn Off The Light turned out to be the biggest hit globally, charting at number 5 on the Billboard Hot 100, and was the second biggest song in New Zealand. I'm Like A Bird was a massive hit as well, peaking number 9 on the Billboard Hot 100 and topping the charts all over the world. Whoa Nelly ended up selling 5 million copies worldwide, peaking at number 24 on the Billboard 200 after nearly a year, and established Nelly Furtado as the star to watch. She did feel struggles at the time with a newfound fame, but was succeeding under the pressure. She did a worldwide tour and won a Grammy Award for Best Female Pop Vocal Performance for her song, I'm Like A Bird. She began working on her next album, Folklore, shortly afterwards. It was an incredible challenge to try and follow up on Whoa Nelly. Folklore continued to explore Furtado 
Hurtado's capabilities as an artist and showcased her passion for her heritage. It was a more refined and mature Hurtado who wanted to fully fulfill her true potential, and in many ways, she did. Unfortunately, this time around, the album wasn't as successful as well as Woe Nelly. Many, however, felt that she had once again showed her originality. This time around, again, she was evolving as an artist, and while the sales didn't reach the level of Woe Nelly, Nelly Furtado did receive mostly positive reviews. The lead single, Powerless, was a minor success in Europe, and in Canada, Furtado's home country reached number 6. It wasn't really a hit in America, but she was making good on her dreams of making Portuguese music. It's often something that she said a lot. She always wanted to make Portuguese music and was willing to go all out and have a full-on Portuguese album. Her song Forza was the official theme song for the 2004 Euros, and she even performed it before the final match between Greece and Portugal. Try is widely considered to be one of her very best songs, but they didn't promote the album well, not to mention that Furtado's label DreamWorks was about to be purchased by Universal Music Group. The company was absorbed into Geffen Records. She wasn't around much during this time period, and the genre changed significantly since Furtado released Wo Nelly. In her eyes, it was necessary to follow up and go for something that's broader. Soon enough, she'd create the album that turned her into one of the biggest stars of the mid-2000s. So in 2005, Furtado began working on the album known as Loose. The album was announced around October 2005, and this time around, she was finally ready to include hip-hop earner music. And the reason why she didn't really do much of that in the past was because, quote, Even though I loved hip-hop music so much, I think I had a bias for a while because I wanted to prove myself as a musician who would use 40 different instruments on one album, and a lot of hip-hop people don't do that, and therefore they don't get as much respect. I really wanted to earn that certain type of musical respect from a certain listener for a long time as a Grammy winner. Now since I've proved myself in that way, I feel a lot of freedom to do the music I really love. Hip-hop was actually for Tato's favorite genre, but she wanted to prove herself. You already know that. Regarding Loose, after a contract was absorbed into Geffen Records, Geffen Records had Jimmy Iovine suggested to her, hey, you should collab with Timbaland. Now, for Tato's change wasn't instantly. That's one thing to mention. It's very important to mention this because of the fact that some people are like, hey, she just went from I'm like a bird to promiscuous. No, it was just the fact that her album didn't do well. It was very political and she didn't feel like the world was willing to listen to that at the moment. However, it goes beyond that. So for Tato had a kid at the time and this kid would travel with her to shows and whatnot. This would become a huge component as to why she was so burnt out after 2007. She came to a point where she wanted to be creative. And at that point, after Geffen Records was absorbed into Interscope, she ended up meeting Jimmy Iovine. This was in 2005. She had already created a couple of tracks for a new album, but he told her straight up to scrap that stuff and work on something new with Timbaland. The reason why he wanted her to work on something new with Timbaland was because of the fact that she already had a great song with Missy Elliott, Get Your Free Count, which was produced by Timbaland, and she showed some of her hip-hop. She showed some of her hip-hop talent, which was actually her favorite genre, as we mentioned earlier. She gets to talking with him, and this meeting is important because he got her to see another perspective that she didn't really see, which led to the meeting with Timbaland. She meets with Timbaland, they're cool with each other because they already collabed before and whatnot, but... This time around, when they started producing music, it was very magical. Well, that's the beauty of, you know, making this album with Timbaland as well. You know, he was, yeah. he's, he's, he's quite a monster in the studio. He's really amazing. And promiscuous, um, really cool, because the man and the woman in the song aren't even playing fields. The first thing he plays me, I think, is the beat for the song called Glow. And the speaker starts smoking, and a little flame comes out. We actually decided not to pull that track up again that night. That real gut instinct of something magical happening in the studio happens, it's really special. And I think we, we really, we really hit those marks on this album. Mm -hmm. She really loved the time spent with him because they go in at night, come in the morning and just have fun. And she loved it because it brought out a different side to her, which in turn, of course, led to her becoming more confident. And the albums were more sexually charged as opposed to the previous ones. She started wearing different clothes and whatnot. And that, that change was gradual. It took time, you know. But it all started with the meeting with Jimmy Iovine. That's important to mention. Then when I worked with Tim, it was like lightning struck. It was like I had loved everything I was doing before and I had written some great songs. When Tim and I first saw each other in Miami, it was like... Like I said, it was like musical love, it was like this force, and we even talked about having a band together. Here's what she had to say about the Loose album. Eye-opening and life-changing. It's made me take my work way more seriously. Finally on Loose, I'm like, I kind of 
figured it out. I think I've evolved, you know, over the years. Mind you, in high school, I was always that girl who would show up with a different style of outfit every day. I've always strived to be an international artist. It was always a goal of mine since I first picked up an instrument when I was a little girl. So fast forward to like 2004, 2005, and he's like, Tim's in Miami, you can go and start working on it. I had already worked in Miami on my little pre-loose demo tapes with Scott Storch and Pharrell, and I'd also worked with Nelly Hooper in England. So I went back to Miami, checked myself into this apartment style hotel called the Sagamore with my cousin who was helping me take care of my 20 month old daughter. Potty training by day, recording promiscuous by night. Rotato looked finally on her time in the factory, stating that herself and Timbaland were just jamming all day and night having fun and add to that her entire image was slowly shedding away from that of her early days she was wearing different clothes acted a different way in videos and the music itself was a complete far cry from what her old stuff was her title used madonna's 1998 ray of light as a template in creating loose saying that she was smooth but sexy universal and epic the album was released on june 6 2006 to positive reviews and the album included the smash hit single promiscuous featuring timbaland which topped the billboard 100 and was a smash hit. The album itself ranked number one on Billboard 200, and it featured a lot of hits. Man Eater, which reached number 16, All Good Things Come to an End, written by Chris Martin. Timbaland would like to call him Coldplay, though. And then there's, of course, Say It Right, which managed to top the charts as well. The song in particular was recorded in the wee hours of the morning, and despite the fact that Furtado was tired, she wanted to show Timbaland she was capable of making something special despite the exhaustion, and she proved him wrong and created the hit single. There's a lot of other songs there, you know. Tebo Ske, which was a good one with Juanes. Great song. She already had a previous song with him, Fotografia. Other than that, she had Showtime, Afraid, Wait For You. There was plenty of smash hits out there, and it's one of the most replayable albums for me personally from that era. It was actually that damn good. I liked it. Lewis made Nelly into one of the biggest stars of 2006, and fans were loving this new Furtado, who was more confident and outgoing. However, others felt that she sold out. The Canadian artist, though, didn't feel that way. It was quite the contrary, saying that making music for a lot of people is honorable, and if she sold out, then why didn't she accept a bunch of offers coming your way? Well, the fact is verified, because Furtado declined a Playboy offer back in 2006, and the offer was worth about a half a million. She'd pose fully clothed, I should note, but with that said, Furtado was a massive star. Around 2007, she had a few features with Timberland and Timberlake, but suddenly, she disappeared. Why is that? Furtado was very exhausted at this point. It wasn't just her disappearing. There was a couple of reasons as to why. 2006 and 2007 were some of her most successful years in her entire career, with 06 being the very most. But there's a couple of things that got in her way. Taking care of a kid is never easy. Especially when you're a celebrity and you have the kid traveling with you. Furtado preferred to have the kid travel with her, going everywhere with her, and this ended up catching up to her. Especially during the tour days. It caught up to her and it was rough. There was also points where she kind of felt like she was a fraud in some ways due to the fact that she changed so much and found so much success. She was very exhausted, she was very tired out, and it was a rough time. Loose was one of the very best albums of that time period, no doubt about it. It just was. It was, because... Furtado basically unlocked another portal and showed, hey, I can do this as well. She did the popular stuff very well. Again, a lot of people didn't like the fact that she changed and whatnot, but it was bound to happen because she didn't really explore the hip-hop stuff. Even then, Loose does have some songs that do feel like they belong in an older Nelly Furtado album, such as uh, Showtime, All Good Things. But yeah, she was exhausted. An album by the name of Me Plan was released in September 2009, and it didn't make big shockwaves in the US or anything like that. Me Plan was initially called My Plan, and it was supposed to follow up on Loose. However, Furtado felt very uninspired writing songs in English, and the moment she put pen to paper writing songs in Spanish, it was the opposite. She was very motivated, very excited, and very interested in making an all-Spanish album. It often makes you wonder, like, what would have been of the sequel to Loose in a different world? Despite this, the album didn't do all that well in America because it was in Spanish. However, everywhere else it seemed to do decently, and her songs actually charted well on the Spanish charts. So, it wasn't a failure, and plus, it was actually a personal goal of hers. It's just the fact that she didn't release a song in English here that somewhat affected her, but that's not the point. She actually found success with Me Plan. It was praised from critics, fans alike. They liked it. Plus, it was the first album she released under her record label, Nelstar. So... It's all good there, and she would start to release independent albums in the future as well. It was of course distributed by Universal Music Latin, and in addition, this album earned her this album earned her a Latin Grammy for Best Female Album. So it all worked out well. A top Billboard Latin song as well, which is something that does not happen often with artists. A song in English and in Spanish top in the charts. She did it. She was doing well. By the time she had worked on a new album in English, it was 2012. That's how far away she was. But like the last time Furtado released an album, Justin Timberlake had just released Sexy Back. It was 2006. 
Chris Brown was coming up. I can go on and on and on. As for what the album went by, it went by the name of Spirit Indestructible. The album didn't reach the success of Loose at all. For one, it received average reviews, which was a huge downgrade from the praises Loose was receiving. And to give you an idea of how successful the album was, well, it reached number 79 on the Billboard 200. And her singles as well weren't hits. The biggest success was Big Hoops charting number 14 in the UK, number 6 for high dance clubs in the US, which is decent. The album flopped as it sold only 3% of what Loose sold in its first week and her time was over. Now, my personal opinion, I feel as if she took too long to make any sort of music. Like from the summer of 2007 all the way up to 2012, Furtado featured in a handful of songs. She wasn't really around the public eye and some feel that she should have created the album much earlier in order to capitalize off the success of Loose. If she released an album in 2008, most definitely with features from Justin Timberlake, Timbaland, Lil Wayne, she would have had a hit because she was a talented artist. She wasn't no one hit wonder or someone that had a fluke album. No, she was actually talented. She proved herself in the previous years. Instead, she made a Spanish album and well, it was self-fulfilling from a personal sense. It didn't chart. But I don't think that mattered to her. Spirit Indestructible struggled to make an impact and finally she once again disappeared, this time around focused on pursuing some personal goals. It wasn't until 2017 that she made an album by the name of The Ride and again it didn't find some success. By the looks of it though, her title's completely satisfied with the way her career went. As a matter of fact, she was the one who backed out during the height of her career. I don't know, I went back to like, I started cleaning my apartment again and I was like, I need to like go back to, I used to be a chambermaid cleaning. I want to just spread light again and like be in touch with my surroundings again. and be connected to everything I do and everything I say. And everything. This is what she had to say in an interview back in 2017, and I quote, I had a nervous breakdown on stage. I was on a loose tour and my daughter was with me as being a mom and a singer on the road and I was exhausted. Then one night I went on stage and I suddenly realized how stressed out I was. I actually cried my way through the first two songs and I took a break from music and went home. And I realized that being at home and having the whole family experience was what I was seeking. Fame took me by surprise and I ended up having a breakdown, it was too much too soon. And after two years of intense touring and partying, I spent hours alone in my LA home just staring at the floor. I felt like a fraud believing that people like me for my image and not my music. Now, taking a break was of course a great thing for her because of the fact that she didn't have to deal with that guilt on a daily, but you guys know how the industry is, it moves quickly. As I said, for Tato, if she didn't take so long and release something in 2008, I'm pretty sure it would have been a hit, but health is what matters and that's what happened here. The ride was released under Nelly's own record label, Nelstar. It was independent and it didn't chart much, but it was very satisfying to her and very fulfilling, which is something that she's often been looking for. One thing to mention is that her previous album, Spirit Indestructible, it wasn't received well. There was some good stuff on it, of course, but it wasn't received well. Add to that, the concerts weren't that amazing, and a lot of people didn't seem interested in what she was doing. They were saying that she doesn't know how to stick in one direction, which is something that she's often said is her strength, and I personally believe that as well. Furtado didn't really show up very often recently until 2022, 2022, when Drake brought her up for I'm Like a Bird performing it in Canada. This was a very notable moment in her return. It felt very inspiring. It felt very cool to see her back once again in the mainstream. And from there, she felt motivated. She's been making a couple of songs recently, even collabed with Timbaland and Timberlake for a song that charted number 84 on the Billboard Hot 100. And as I'm making this video, she's actually collabed with Juanes once again. Juanes is somebody who's maintained a close relationship with her throughout the years. And they're always down to collab. This time around, it's no different. It feels like her legacy is more often than not. From my point of view, it feels like she preferred her Whoa Nelly era a lot. And has actually started embracing her loose era recently. You know, ever since she came back in 2022, after the whole Drake performance, he's singing I'm Like a Bird and stuff, she's been back in the public eye, making music often. And Stasis nostalgia is kind of all around, so maybe Furtado will have another hit on her hands. We'll see, but it doesn't really matter if she does because... I'm pretty sure she's just fulfilling her personal goals at this point. She's around, people love her. She had a great career, it was wonderful.